Hi everyone, and welcome to Tapping Your Creativity in My Studio. Sorry, I was looking at something else. Um, we are so excited to welcome today artist, author, speaker, and psychiatrist, my friend Nancy Hillis. She is an incredible human being that helps artists across the nation on her workshops, on her uh, studio. She is someone that has been an example to a lot of us in the art world. She is an incredible author of two books. Um, uh, one is uh, The Artist's Journey, uh, Bold Strokes to Spark Creativity, as well as The Artist's Journey Creativity Reflection Journal. So um, she will join us soon, I hope, and I uh, can't wait to have her join us. Um, so if you're out there, Nancy, please join in and uh, hopefully she will be coming in pretty quickly here. Um, anyways, uh, while she is coming in, um, I can tell you a little bit about her. Um, Nancy is, um, she's a doctor, uh, she's an artist, and I, like I said, she's a speaker from um, Stanford trained uh, psychiatrist and um she nancy guides artists to create their deepest most uh, most authentic art through her signature approach which combines um art and psychiatrist uh at the saint psychiatry she's helped thousands of artists transform their work from inside out and um operating from the conviction that artists um, creations has as much to do with psychology as it does with paint on canvas. So um, here, I think she's right here. Hold on, guys. Um, nope, not yet. Sorry. Uh, Nancy, uh, we are waiting here for you to join us. So I hope that you are in the right place. Um, and uh, we'll wait for a couple of minutes. And if for some reason you're not here, oh, there she is. That's great. Okay. So, um, one second, guys. Now she'll be joining us and she can talk to us about everything that I just said. She is, um, and there she is. Yay. Hey, hey. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> I was you getting nervous there for a minute, <laughs> trying to read, you know, trying to read everything that you, uh, that you were saying me on your bio. And I'm like, oh my God, she's a much better, uh, oh. you know, explanation of her work and her <laughs> life than myself. So, Oh, I got nervous there for a minute. So sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much for joining me and tapping into your creati creativity in my studio today. Um, will you please tell us a little bit about who you are, where do you uh, work, and who you are as an artist? Yes. So first of all, thank you so much, Sandra, and thank you, everyone who is here um, I really love what you're doing with Feeding America and with the whole issue around food insecurity, especially during these times. So I'm so excited to be a part of this. So thank you for that beautiful work you're doing. Thank you for, for helping me do it. Without you guys, I couldn't do it myself. So, so it's beautiful work. Um, I'm Nancy Hillis, and I am an abstract artist. I live in Santa Cruz, California, and I love everything about creativity, and I've written some books, and I teach courses, and so on, uh, but my deepest love, I think, one of them is creativity, so here we are. This is tapping into creativity, right? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so Nancy, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your history. Where were you born? How did you get into 
art because um, your your story is so fascinating to me. You have so many facets of your life that you have applied it to what you are today. So please tell us a little bit about how that started for you. Well, thank you so much. Yes, it's been a long circuitous road for me. I grew up in Arkansas and I was very drawn to you know, art and to quilts, uh, but I never really had an art class until much later in my life. And, you know, so I had a dream about kind of being an artist or a creative in some way. I also had another dream, though, and that dream was to become a physician. And I think a deep story for me is uh, Dante in Dante's Inferno, Dante Alighieri, who spoke across for me seven centuries. Uh, I read his book, The Inferno, when I was 17, and, and it really awakened something in me because to me, that is a deep um, story of really the hero's journey and the artist's journey where you step into the unknown and you have some kind of yearning, uh, but you're afraid. And that would be what I see in life that we're continually being called to something and oftentimes we'll turn our face away. Oftentimes we'll reject or refuse the calling. Uh, but eventually though, it keeps calling you and you've got to answer that. And that's what happened for me. So I, I went down this journey of. But you were 17 at that time. Yes. I was 17 when I read that I stayed home. I, I was feeling kind of down. It was the senior year. And I was feeling kind of down and, and Dante spoke to me at a time when I felt uh, kind of lost, not sure where I was going, that type of thing. And so I would show up for physics at the end of <laughs> the class, you know, day, but otherwise I, I stayed home a lot and I read a lot. And this particular book really spoke to me. And I think that there can be these pivotal moments in one's life, certain things can happen. And so that really informed me. But then I, I answered the call for my dream to become a physician. I went to medical school and that's a whole journey. And on that journey. Tell me about I, it. I have right? my husband who is also in the field. So, um, so you know, I know all about that. Yes. You know all about that. It's very circuitous. And within that, I was in internal medicine. Then I was in diagnostic radiology. And then I moved to psychiatry, existential psychiatry. And there was a guy at the Brigham in Boston who, he was a neurosurgeon, a wonderful kind of all in all degrees, uh, Dr. John Chilito. And when I switched from um, radiology to psychiatry, he said, oh, Nancy, you're going from shadows to nuances. So we talk about reading shadows in radiology. And then of course the nuances of psychotherapy. Um, so I have I a love, lot I actually interest. love that because you can apply that to paint. We can talk yes. about that later, but I, I love yes. that phrase. Yes. Shadows to nuances. I thought that was beautiful. Yes. So then I'm in psychiatry, which was for me more creative than frankly, radiology or internal medicine. It was very, uh, very much about stepping into the unknown with a person in the room uh, you know, going into deep material, into the psyche, into the relationships. And, with, and so within that, then there was another pivotal moment for me when a psychiatrist invited me to a Zen tea party or a Zen tea ceremony, actually. And we did this whole beautiful ceremony. And I brought a poem from Lorca. And it was like this moment that just kind of woke me up again. Because I've been dreaming of, you know, maybe abstract watercolor or writing poetry or all these creative dreams, but I was so busy with the work of residency, which I'm sure you with know. the grind. Yes. The everyday grind. You have no time for anything, really. No, you don't. You don't. You are married to the hospital. <laughs> and yes. So yes. right. Yes. So there was this pivotal yeah. moment. And so what happened in that wonderful invitation by another person yes. is I realized, oh, how much I wanted to create again. I wanted to write, I wanted to paint, I wanted to sculpt. 
And I decided the day I left residency, finally, seven years of residency training, I wanted to study sculpture. But I didn't know how. And I, but I found my teacher by calling around. And basically, she said, Adrian Duncan. And she said, I said, Adrian, I don't know what I'm doing. And she said, great. <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> and I knew she was my teacher then because I knew she was all about stepping into the unknown. So let's just, said, let's just say what year is this and where are you at this point? So at this point, I'm at Stanford. I, this is in 1993. Okay. 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 And uh, so I, she said, grab, get some, you know, 25 pounds of clay and come to my house. And I did. And, and then it just took off from there. And the rest is history because one step leads to the next, to the next, to the next. And you don't know ahead of time where that's going. But that's it's like correct. you're in a river and it's going. Yes. And you have right. to let those feelings flow and let them, um, your, instu your intuition kind of lead you that way. And I think you let that happen. Uh, because if you wouldn't have, if you would have say, you know, I've been through residency for three, seven years, and now this is my path, period. Um, instead, you opened yourself up for uh, something that was telling you that, you know, you always wanted to do even though that you didn't know how to, and then you attacked at full force and look at you now. So you never know what that instinct uh, can take you in life. You never know. And it's, and it's scary. I mean, I, I deal with fear all the time. It's scary and yet that does not have to stop you. Correct. Right? Yes. And something's calling you. And if you can notice these, these callings can be very subtle too sometimes. And it's, it's easy to dismiss it or miss it, but it's important to, to try to notice these very subtle creative impulses. So after you did your sculpture and you thought, okay, this is something that I'm looking into for myself to develop, what happened? So then what happened is then I'm in this realm of, of you know, kind of being an artist and being a psychiatrist. So I was practicing psychiatry and I still am. Uh, kind of existential psychotherapy, which is really about getting at meaning and uh, aliveness in one's life. And art, and what I started to notice is that art was, they were, they were very similar. They, they mirrored one another. And I believe that our art mirrors our lives in the state that we're in or the states that we're in. And so there was this really interesting intersection of art and psychiatry and creativity and then science. And it just keeps going. I keep seeing these intersections, which are So I think now would be, a, I guess, a good question to ask you. Um, how has COVID and everything else that's been going on in this world at this time in our lives how has it affected your work or yourself? And because you are still giving therapy, um, how do you see it affecting others? Yes, yeah, so it's, you know, there are a range of things. I, I feel that there's a great deal of grief in this process and this experience of, of grappling with the pandemic um, and stress, anxiety, and that kind of thing. And, and so what I see is that I actually get on Zoom calls or FaceTime calls or just regular calls with people that I've been seeing. And this, they, I think they find this, you know, this connection very helpful because we're all isolated uh, and have been for a long time since mid-March here in California. Right. Yeah. So I, you know, it's just keeping that hope alive, keeping the resilience there, finding ways to continually find meaning. Uh, and in some ways, there's been surprise opportunities within this tragedy, and that is many people have found themselves reading more or spending more time in their relationships at home or with their children. I right. you know, read about mothers who are saying, I finally get to have more time with my children. 
Um, so I've seen, a, you know, a wide range of different things. Yeah, yeah, like I said before, you know, this is the, the time to um, be introspective, uh, listen and learn um, from what's happening so we can come out of it a better, better persons ourselves. Um, yep. And yes. by becoming a better person yourself, you become a better partner, a better parent, a better daughter, a better parent, you know, parent, anything, friend. Yes. Um, and this is the time that, you know, to start something new for yourself and challenge yes. yourself um, and not let this big noise um, attack you in a way that you remain paralyzed. Um, I think that this is the, the right time to start whatever it is, just start, you know? Yes, just start, right? <laughs> and I think creating is just so healing. And so art is very healing in yes. these times, right? Because you can access these deeper parts of yourself and you can keep a journal and you can, you know, keep creating and keep finding hope and meaning in this. Yes. So um, you're out of, you, you, you are an author of yes. two amazing books. Um, and uh, I did mention them in the beginning. So the first one is The Artist's Journey, Bold Strokes to Spark Creativity. And the second one is The Artist's Journey, Creativity, Reflections Journal. So I want you to talk to us a little bit about uh, the intersections of art um, science and psychology, how do you apply it then into your concepts of art and science? How, how, how does it all play out for you? Yes. Well, I just find this so fascinating is how these all weave together. And some, some concepts that I find really helpful for artists and creators come from math, science, psychology, in evolutionary biology. And so uh, one very powerful one is called zero to one. And that's from mathematics. And that's the concept that from zero to one is larger mathematically. That, that interval is larger than one to two or two to three or three to four. So from nothing to something is enormous. And then there's something to something, something to something, right, as you go down. So starting, starting anything is is heroic is is absolutely fabulous so a lot of times it's just, just start just begin you can start anywhere and so that's a big one from mathematics that i write about and talk about another one is experimentation i believe that experimentation which is really you could say that comes from science in the lab is um it's the sine qua non i believe of creating. It's the, it is what creating is about. Creating is about not knowing. It's about continually evolving your work. It's about stepping into that unknown. So experiment, experiment, experiment. That's another thing that I teach and encourage and remind myself. And to. when you're experimenting, you're on your unconsciousness because you can't use your consciousness in order right. to experiment, correct? You don't already know. What's going to happen? I love this this uh, quote from Michael Cutlip. He's over in Berkeley, and he said something like, "Somebody interviewed him, and and he said, you know, when I go into my studio, if I already know what's going to happen, it's all over." Right, for yeah. sure. I think it applies to right. every single one of us. Yeah, we just need yeah. to not know. That's right, and, and be okay with not knowing. Exactly. <laughs> so that's a big part, not knowing. So then another area that is absolutely fascinating and is it comes from evolutionary biology and it's called the adjacent possible. And this concept was described by uh, Dr. Stuart Kaufman and Bruce Sawhill, my partner, way back, long ago, at the Santa Fe Institute. And this concept is, it's about where you're, you take a step, you make a move. So you make a move on your painting, you take a step in your life and that step illuminates a number of possible steps that were not only invisible, but because of your action, they came into existence. They didn't exist before. 
So they were not only invisible, but they didn't exist before. And your action, your action changes the environment and you're really co-creating with the environment. To make it visible. Yeah, you're, co you're in co-evolution, co-creation. So that is mind blowing to me. Uh, so what you just like said is uh, reminds me of a quote from um, Enrique Martinez uh, Celar that he uh, Celaya that he said the work of an artist unfolds in the experience of wrestling with the moment. Yes, yes, yes. Unfolding, unfolding, and then it's the ad it, the adjacent in that moment opens up other possibilities. Correct. And, you know, it's interesting. Years ago, I was fascinated by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where Heisenberg talked about the observer changes what's observed, like in the in the lab or you know in science or whatever. The observer right. changes it. But whereas with the adjacent possible, your act of creating affects existence itself. Correct. That's a say that again new. because it's it's complex. Yes. So say it again. Yeah. So. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is where, you know, your observation changes what's being observed. This is from theoretical physics. Okay. The adjacent possible is where your act of creating affects existence itself. Got it. So that's huge. huge. <laughs> yes. So that's a big one. I'm going to turn, I, I turned off comments, you guys, because we're, I'm going to turn them on um, at the end. I'm going to leave like 10 to 15 minutes for questions for Nancy. But um, just for you guys to know that I am conscious about the, the comments, um, but we want to see Nancy and actually listen to what she has to say. So go ahead, Nancy. Okay. And then the last one, or there's more, but you know, another big, big kind of pillar is the inner landscape, basically, from psychology. I mean, that's like, you know, mindfulness. That's like, you know, your mindset. That's the inner narrative that is affecting you in every realm of, of your life and of your art. So it's really important to be aware of that. And um, I'm very much into the why to, not the how to. I'm not that... I'm not as interested in the how to. I'm not that particularly interested in techniques, quite frankly. I'm interested in, in deep foundational principles and concepts and why. Why do this anyway? Because the why drives action. And so, do you help your path. students um, get to that point where they know the why? Um, because sometimes they just, you know, they just do, but they don't know why. Yeah. And that's okay. There, there's, it's, that's, that, but even asking the question, like Rilke said, live the questions, just asking the question is a powerful thing. You don't actually, you don't have to know why, but when you ask yourself, oh, why is this important to me? Then you live that question and you live into that question and things start to unfold when you do that. So it's okay, you know, to not know why, and it's good in some ways to not know, but to continually ask the question and the why can evolve, right? Right, in these, for sure. In these spirals. Yes, right? yes. But I think at some point uh, it is, you know, yes, it's important not to know the why, but like you said, just to even ask the question. Yeah. Um, but it's important also to understand your own language with your work, whatever that might be. I think it's very important that you connect with your work, even if you don't know why. But yes. if you have that kind of connection with your work and a language that you understand each other, because your artwork is your partner, right? Yes. And so you yes. kind of have to understand a little bit of how you came about for this. You may be not conscious on the process, but there must be some sort of connection. Yeah. And I think the more you ask yourself that question, why is this important to me? It helps you to move past resistance and procrastination. Um, and, then, and then as you start to have this dialogue with yourself about what's going on as you're creating and even thinking about it afterwards. And that's why I think having a journal is really a powerful thing. You, 
you start to develop a language and a lexicon uh, uh, around your work and you begin to understand it more. At first, you know, you probably don't know what it's about. But if you'll just keep asking the questions, eventually it, it starts to unfold. It will give you a narrative. Yes. Yes. So, okay, Nancy. So let's talk about your actual work. Um, okay. And if you want to show us some of your paintings, that will be fantastic. Yes. Yes, definitely. So, okay. Um, can you see right now? Yes. Oh, perfect. I'll take this. Shall I take I this off? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. I will flip this around so we can. Perfect. So you can take us around your studio and show us your studio too. Did that work? Uh, okay. You haven't flipped it. Yeah, there we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. So I'll show you around my studio and then we'll look at the work. But basically, I have a very small studio. I work with a great deal of constraint. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a small, it's like a basically a bedroom. And I've always had fairly small studios. So um, there's no excuse for people at home that say, oh, but my, my space is so small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, actually, it's, yeah, I know of a story of uh, one of my teachers long ago was telling me he had a student who wanted a gorgeous studio. And uh, I'll come back on here for a second. And basically, he helped her to, you know, plan the studio and, and build it. And then once she had this beautiful studio, she stopped painting. It was almost like it was intimidating. So there's something to be said for the constraint of maybe not the greatest studio, <laughs> maybe a small studio. Uh, you have to I be have, creative. You have to really, have to be, really be creative with your space so it can work. You sure do. So let me, tr let me come back around. Hold on just a second. Do you, Nancy, do you mainly work on paper? I I do because of this constraint issue. Now I do okay. have canvas. I'll show you down below. Do you see there? There's a roll of canvas yes. down there. Yes. So that's raw canvas. And sometimes I'll go outside if it's going to be a gigantic painting. Um, but I do work on paper a lot. And you can see these works. Um, like for instance, this work is quite minimalist over here. Do you yes. see that? Yes. And I can go in on it and show you. So there's not a lot of paint on this either. There's, there's mark making and a little bit of paint. Okay. Yes. So sometimes I just feel like being very minimalist. Other times I might go in and, and add more. I, I was in this kind of movement in these beautiful blues. And I here we've got more paint on this one. And a very different application of the paint. Yeah. And then there's different some... brushes, different brush strokes, mm -hmm. different uh, right. materials that you use. Yeah. So I just change it up. Here's another. I'm very big on creating lots of starts. So for example, um, okay, so for example, I might make five to 20 starts activating the canvas. I call it the canvas, but it may be paper. Yeah. And then looking at those and then picking one or two to work up further, you know, whatever draws me that day. So that's one way I might work. Other okay. times it's just, I'll just go in and just start a painting. What kind of paper do you use? What do you like using? I love BFK Reeves printmaking paper. This is BFK Reeves. It really is, it's got a kind of thickness and some kind of, surface that I really, really like. Uh, I also cool. like, um, uh, hold on just a second. I also do work with Borden and Riley, which is very inexpensive. You know, like when I'm giving Is workshops. it heavyweight? Does it take, um, you know, watercolor or acrylic well? It takes acrylic well. It's, it's only 90 pounds. That's not that is a very, it's an ex inexpensive way to go. Like if you're giving a workshop or something like that and you've got to have a lot of paper. Yeah. Uh, but I also enjoy painting on it too. And you can thicken it up if you want if, by using white latex paint yes. and toughen it up or not. I actually just love raw paper. I don't tend to gesso anything. Yeah, I, I don't either. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's another one I like. It's a Somerset Coventry rag 
vellum finish, 290 grams. And you that's can get heavy. it. That's yeah, two that's and this is I think two two ninety, this BFK Reeves. Okay. So both all of those I really like. Um and then I you know, sometimes work on panel and canvas. So <laughs> Yeah. And then uh, another thought thing I thought I would show you. So hold on just a second. Bruce, do you want to yeah. come help me with this? Um, so I'll step back for a second on this okay. one. Can you see this? Yes. If you can, uh, there we go. There. Yes, we can see it. Okay. So this is two pieces of BFK Reeves vertically and then they're together. And this is a, you know, light value, predominantly light value painting. This is like when I really want to explore breathing space. It looks like a minimal in. palette there, right? Very minimal. Yeah. Very much about the limited palette and, and the constraint of that. I don't know if you can see that, but. Yes, very much so. It's very, it's also the light on light, the white on the barely, just slightly, uh, darker value. Yeah, I love. I love that. You can really see that. Yes. You know. So yes. I love, love, love white on white. I love black on black. <laughs> so this is one. You know, I just very much enjoy. And it started with the mark making. It started with the underlying subtle mark making, and then you just edited. kind of responding. Now another very interesting thing that happened that I want to show you. And this might be an, something to think about. So I've got the, Bruce, can you pull the board out a bit? So you see this gigantic board? Wait, no, you just pulled the whole board. Scoot it out a little bit like that. Okay. Okay, I'm going to step way back. Can you see this painting yeah, on this board? Yes, there we go. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this painting was informed by, can you pull that back, Bruce? Just take it off. The oh, board itself. That. Do you see? Oh, I love that. Yes. The board yes. itself. Yeah. You see all those drips and wonderful marks? Yes. <laughs> so then I yes. thought, in the, let's see this again. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do like 20 paintings that are kind of like this, but variations on the theme and really, really take it further. And, and explore. And, yeah. Yeah. I love like I might, that. Might go in with a gigantic brush. You know, this wonderful big mama brush I love. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> there we go. And go in, you know, I might want to go in with some big, big moves on that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you have some, um, you know, I can see on that one that you have um, horizontal and vertical. So it's playing with us in a geometrics kind of way, That's but it right. has the language of, um, you know, moving your eye through the whole piece mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it gives you that calmness. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it with the drips coming down, it almost feels like they want to break that calmness. That's right. So, that horizontal. Yes. That yeah. Really does, isn't it? Yeah. So it's like, mm -hmm. um, it almost has this um, juxtaposition of trying to stay calm, but then these lines are coming in to interrupt that. Mm -hmm. And um, I really, really enjoy that. That is, that is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just a second. Let me do, do, do this around again. Yeah. I really believe that there's such a power in just noticing things like that. And that's that subtle creative impulse and go, Hey, well, let's try it. And then from there work in a series, because in a series, you don't make one painting precious. You can, you can really experiment in a series. And that's what I always talk about. Like right? it takes us hundreds of tries to get the right painting that we want, you know? And, yeah. um, but right. on those hundred tries, you can be so free and not think, and then an accident happens and you love it. And so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's, yes. and it's amazing because one is informing the next and the next That's and the right. next. That's and right. when you talk about um, from zero to one and yes. that space of starting, yes. that might be your first one, That's right? right. And yes. then from first to second to third to fourth yeah. and, you know, and so on, 
it's just it's an information that is just uh, a rhythm. So yes. you go on a rhythm. Yes. And I think do. math has a rhythm, you know? Yes, and so it does. If, if we listen to that, um, you know, like that painting per se has the rhythm of repetition of yes. the lines that That's are going nice. horizontal and vertical. And so um, I totally understand now um, where you're coming from and the yes. language that you're using on your paintings, which is Thank fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You know, and I love what you were saying there. I loved listening to you about that because it is, yeah, math and math is, real, you know, math and music are very closely related. And it's, right. there's that rhythm, right? Rhythm is right. huge in music and the space right. between the notes, right? Right. It's the space that you have in between the notes, but also yeah. that rhythm of the repetition of your language that you're, you know, that um, yeah. I think that the viewer, um, each one of us has a different way of seeing things. Um, yes. That's my own interpretation when I saw yes. that. And uh, yeah, that's the absolutely. beauty of it. There's not just one way to, to uh, appreciate art. And, right. uh, you that's know, right. and, and non-objective art sometimes, it's very hard to comprehend. Um, yeah. And so uh, you just gave us a really awesome way to, to see it. So yeah. Um, yeah. are you going to show us? Yeah, go ahead. I will. I was just going to say one other thing I want to say is, um, is don't be afraid of the ugly painting because <laughs> that's where the juice is. Because I believe that's, that's kind of the nascent embryonic forms of new work that's trying to emerge. And it's, sometimes it's in this awkward embryonic state, but if you know if you allow that and actually embrace it when you go oh that's a ugly painting or it's it's strange or whatever it's awkward actually it's a good sign because you're pushing those the envelope you're pushing the boundaries yes and yeah. so much knowledge and information comes from the ugliness yeah. that's right <laughs> uh, which which uh mirrors our life right now oh and, yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> and there is so much learning uh to be have right now and yes. so, um, yes. so anyways, um, so Nancy, I'm so excited because you're yeah. going to teach us a little bit about yeah. how to activate and uh, a little bit about how you go um, about it. So let's yeah. go into that now. Okay. Sounds great. So I might have to have Bruce come in and help me a bit, but hold on. Yes. A Thank you, Bruce, for <laughs> helping us out today. I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you when I'm ready. <laughs> so we'll, we'll move this over here. Um, and I will take these down. Perfect. I've got a plan here in this madness. <laughs> yes, I know you do. And that's why um, I'm so impressed that you have everything so um, lined up so perfectly oh, well. So you're doing you so a great much. job, Nancy. Thank you so oh, much. I'm going to turn some comments back on for while okay. you um, yeah. I know that um, we... Um, yeah, somebody asked if this will be recorded. Yes, this will stay in um, my Instagram um, feed as well as Nancy's and uh, everywhere. So don't worry if you can't see it right now, it will be recorded. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Nancy is just getting prepped to show us what's coming up next. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <is> yes, <laughs> this is really fun. I love this so much. So let me just hold on. And uh, so Bruce, can you kind of hold on just a second? We're just so there's started. a question on how do you choose the colors? Uh, when, when do you choose them? And if you do? Yeah, so basically, um, I really am fond of a limited palette. And so can you talk to us for people that don't understand what yeah. a limited palette is? Yeah. So a limited palette is really constraining your colors down to just a few colors. It's akin to constraining your value patterns down to a few values, like for example, two to four values. So with a limited palette, you might work with, you could work with one color, but you might work with two or three or four and that's that. You don't pull every color you've got. You don't bring in every color you've got. You don't bring in all of these colors. Do you see these colors? Yes. <laughs> you don't bring in all these colors. <laughs> yes. That's not a limited palette. 
<laughs> no, look at all of these. <laughs> yes, exactly. So exactly. we don't want to bring every color in there. We want to use just a few. And I used to resist that. I resisted it. I resisted this idea of a limited palette or that kind of constraint because I thought it was going to limit me. But what I learned from the research on creativity is actually within a constraint is an almost unlimited potential. And well, you can get so many values within, yeah. you know, you can just mix and all of a sudden you have yeah. all this incredible, you know, values of your limited palette. So you're not yeah. really limited. Um, it's, you're it's, so open. I mean, if you look at, I do this talk on, uh, there's this, uh, Apple University has this super secretive kind of creativity, you know, university. And one of the things that they taught there was Picasso's 11 lithographs, where he took a bull, the constraint of the bull, and he kept breaking it down and simplifying, 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 until it was almost, it was just down to one. Unreadable. Movie, yes. Right? Of yes. Line. And, you know, uh, Da Vinci said uh, that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Or I think Mark Twain said, I would write a sh shorter letter, but it would take me too much time. Yes. So, <laughs> this, right? Distilling yes. things down is, is challenging, but it's got tremendous possibilities. There's this guy at Apple who said, um, a thousand no's for every yes. Oh, that's, but that's 100% sure, especially in this profession. Um, yeah. You know, if yeah. you decide to be a professional artist, you'll get more than a thousand no's before yeah. you get a yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also, you know, saying no to things is important as well. To and being know. okay with saying no. Yeah, yes, yes. That's the key. Yes. And you have to learn right. that with trial and error because I used yeah. to be the yes girl until yes. I decided no more. I think a lot of us have been that, <laughs> yes. Yes. you know, and it reflects too, like when you can, can when you can say no to a thousand colors, yes. but yes to three, you're, that gets reflected in your life. Correct. Okay. So yes. that's what we're talking about. There is massive power and constraint. So thank you for letting us know what that meant. Yeah. Thank you for asking for further refinement on that. So there's many ways I start things, but I'll show you a few just yeah. because I think starts again, zero to one are so powerful and so exciting. So yes. one way I might go is I might just take some various pencils and, you know, just start activating, you know, basically this is, this is stream of consciousness mark making. This is, if you can see it, um, and it might be it might be slow, or it might be fast, you know, whatever, whatever. And it's whatever your marks are, whatever your lines are. So I'm just gonna I'm just trying to give you an idea, okay? Yeah, so for activating, sure. Activating that surface. Yes. Um, you know, and then so you making the invisible visible for the first time. That is right, and you're you're developing. A history on this surface. Here's a little bit thicker marker. This is a pit oil oil base. So you, you're going to be able to see that one more. Yes, for you sure. Know, whatever. And just this is stream of consciousness. Uh, this is the spontaneous, right? We're just staying spontaneous. And I just saw you switch hands. Yeah, I go back and forth. You can even use both hands at the same time. Whatever. It really. It's whatever you want to do. It's listening to your body, your your lexicon. You know, it might be big looping things, right? Who knows what it is? Could be yeah. angular. Yeah. It could be curvy. Right, and, and it just and depends on. also the pressure that you that you apply, like you were saying. That's right. And then you could go in and knock some of that back. Here, here is an eraser. What is this? Some kind of a plastic. This is a plastic eraser. Uh, it could be any kind of eraser. Just randomly knocking it back. This one ends up adding. Adding more. Art. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? 
you can even use that as a mark maker. You absolutely could. And you could go into, I love these Derwent XL graphite sticks. They're tiny now because I use them all the time. They're down. But I'll show you the box. Was that? See the, that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I, do. I love those. Yes. So you could go and in. I believe, um, did you give me those? Yes, you did. Oh, I have yeah. a list of uh, Nancy's materials, you guys. So I'm going to name all of her materials that she's using. Yeah. So you see I get a darker, you know, mark there and lighter. Lighter I'll go in and seal that uh, with some with medium, like some, I might go in with some gloss uh, medium, I might, or, or, or satin medium. Uh, Do you use I, any spray? Do you use any fixatives? Well, no. you know, interestingly enough, recently I started playing around with milk because oh. Degas, Degas would take his, 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 you know, chalk drawings and things and pour milk on it and it works. Really? It's yeah, that, it, works. it sets it? What happens? That's it. So I just used regular milk. I put it into one of these sprayer bottles like this. I was just experimenting. And I put it out, I went outside, I had this other painting, and I did three coats, you know, one, you know, let do one, let it dry, do another. It was already setting by the second coat. Wow. So that's very interesting. There is a little bit of a smell for a while, but then I found that it goes away. People have asked me about that. <laughs> so where, where did you read about this? I haven't heard it. I was researching because uh, I knew that there was some kind of solution where some people were using skim milk and some denatured alcohol. Okay. And so then I thought, well, I, I dug into it and I read that Degas just would pour milk and I figured it was just regular milk. And that's what wow. I Wow. <laughs> oh my God. I love that. Yeah, I do too. Now this. Thank you, Nancy, for that tip. You're welcome. So Sandra, this is a gigantic piece of charcoal. This is what I was using on this other painting that I sealed with milk. Okay. It, it makes like, you know, it really is dark, right? And where do you get that, Nancy? So that one, I think I got, I think it may be Generals. You know, it's called Generals is the, and I think I got it through either Jerry's Artorama or Blick. Okay, great. Yeah. So that really, oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Um, that really gets on your hands. And that one's harder to, to seal, right? Give so what do you seal it with? That's that uh, milk. On that one? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. I, I'll see if I can show you. Hold on just a second. Just stay right there, Bruce. I'll That's incredible. That. I love the um, all the mark makings right now. They're showing us all the different, you know, materials that you've used and uh, yeah. you can really tell. Thank you. So this was the one where I had a, a bunch of charcoal like that, general charcoal. And yeah. this is when I put the milk on. Wow. And, and it's, it um, what, what happens after? Can you work on top of that? Yeah, I could go back into it right now. Okay. You know, that'd be a lot of fun. So there you go. There's, that's one that's got the milk. Okay, just a second. Let me, um. It's a lot of moving pieces, you guys. <laughs> There's a lot of moving pieces. <laughs> so now what I might do is I might go in with a, I love these long handled brushes. Now the problem is that they no longer make them. It's, it's very hard to find them. So, but you can use branches, you can use wood sticks, and you can just attach your brush to it. Absolutely. And that will make the trick just as well as a long um, brush. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's what I do at workshops is I have all these brushes and then we get these dowels and we- Right, exactly. Right. So Home Depot has all of those and you can just- Yeah. 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 So basically then, and I'm opening up right now latex paint because it's just easier right now. But so the latex think, paint that you use is this house paint? Yeah, this is house paint. Okay. Because you know, when I'm making big paintings, um, it's less expensive to get the, the latex house paint. And, and it works I, well with, with acrylic? Uh-huh, oh yeah. 
Okay. It's acrylic latex house paint, so okay. it's fine. Yeah. You know, and so basically I'm getting different, you know, this is going to be a little different because it's, this is acrylic, right? And I'm just, again, activating, right? Yeah, and as you see, Nancy's really not thinking, she's doing. And yeah, people right. ask me um, if you can talk a little bit more about the why. Yeah, so yeah, the why. And it's like, when I think about why, it's like, that's the kind of driving force. Are we talking about the psychological why? Is this yeah. the question? Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like the driving force of, of anything. It's kind of like what... Now, what's, you could also say, what's meaningful about this to me? And for me, uh, painting and creating brings me alive. I feel alive, and it feels very meaningful to me. Because um, I have to be learning continually, and art is so perfect for that, because you could never get to the end of it. Yes, I think and that applies to everything in life. I think when you stop wanting to learn, you become mediocre. Um, we don't ever want to be mediocre. We always no, we want won't. to learn and better ourselves. Yeah, and access the ineffable and the mysterious that's within you. And so 100%. That, right? That's a big, yes. big part for me. It's just yes. so wonderful. Yes. Um, so anyway, you know, you get the idea. We're, we're yes, we're and you, I know that you have a, a painting behind it that you wanted yes. to show us yes. that's um, more yes. advanced. Well, um, I can show you. Can I show you one more thing on this? Yes, please. Okay. Oh my gosh. So, oh, you're using this, the mama brush. This is the big mama. This is my favorite. <laughs> it's Skoda Sash Brush Eight. I love this thing. I love that thing. Plastic in your hand. Yes. And then I just <laughs> dip it down into the latex paint. I have to be careful because this stuff will sling paint. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I might like go in and, you know, do some kind of rhythmic thing, right? Yes. Love that. Right? And you, you just, yes. Yeah, you just don't know what's going to happen. And so, and then sometimes what we'll do is tear up and use rhythmic uh, pieces and recombine. And that's a whole other thing. Combinatorics is a mathematical concept. <laughs> so we oh, use a lot wow. of math and science. But anyway, that gives you some idea that you can do so much with your body, with your gesture, and don't worry about it. You know, do you yeah. um, do you ever cut some of your pieces and then um, collage into something else? Yes. Yes. So sometimes you, you know, might do a, a rhythmic sequence and segment and then you know, just make a whole bunch of those and then maybe tear some big pieces, smaller pieces, combine, recombine, try different movements, then go back in and paint into that. And then, and then we move into this realm I'll tell you about, which is about, it's the, the spot, it's kind of like the spontaneous and the considered. It's the dance between the spontaneous and then the part of you that comes in with a decisive move or a decision. Yes. Because yes. creativity, we decision is a big part of creating. It's cutting oh, yes. through. It, yes. it comes from the Latin word desidere, to cut through. So let me show you something. This takes you into this next painting. I have to, these clips are fantastic too, by the way. Yes, We've it's got, true. It holds everything together. Yeah, the hardware store. And they don't harm your piece. <laughs> They don't harm your painting, and they are really great. So just and you can get them at Home Depot, right? Yeah. Have you seen those? Yes, I have. Okay, let me move this over. Oh, we're really matching right now, Nancy. Not only <laughs> our shirts, but our backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love black and white. and I do, too. Was, Oh, there's you know, something to say about that. Here we go. Look. You see that? Let me see. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, my goodness. Yep. I do We're see it. We are totally matching. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn back some comments now. Um, okay. So if you have a question, this will be uh, 
perfect time to ask um, Nancy. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, me or Nancy will be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. And uh, if it's not live, uh, you can um, put it on your comments. Um, oh, question. Uh, is milk archival? Well, it worked for uh, Degas, so I figured that was good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know yet. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you set up the board to paint on? Okay, so um, hold on just a second, let me. So the board? Yeah. Uh, so what I do, I've got a, is it a Klopfenstein easel? easel. A very heavy duty metal easel. And then we get this board, four foot by six foot uh, plywood board from the hardware store. Birch plywood. Birch plywood. And we just put it on there. Half inch right? thick. Right? Half inch thick. Okay. And I have another board, you know, I would love to have more boards if I had, had more room in here. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I love these boards because you can take them on and off, right? Yes, yes. And you can even have a painting behind on the back side of the board. So sometimes yes. I'll flip the board around. Someone so, is asking if you ever use Spectrum Fixative. I have not. I am aware okay. of it, um, but I have not. So... <laughs> <laughs> I've got a method where I kind of use the shape or this is another tool I love if we can find it hold on just a second uh oh here it is I love this thing so much the color shaper yes I love those ah. those are and so I, great to spread things out to you know it just feels very yeah. free uh on how yeah. you do it um people ask if you spray at the end with the milk no you can spray in the middle and then you can continue sure. working with it that's right. um, and so it's, it, it works like a fixative. So think yeah, of it as a fixative. Yeah, um, I mean, another question is, is yeah. can you show us the paint can that you use? They want to see yeah. what kind of paint that you what use. What kind of paint is this? Hold on just a second. Bruce, can you help me? Can you? Hold on just a minute. What is this? Do we know? Oh, gosh. It's the paint fell on it. Just a second. I have a whole one for white too. Okay, it's Vaspa or Volspar. V A L S P A R. Okay, Nancy, you'll send me that too, and I'll add yeah. it to our to our it's thing. A, yeah, I will send. Yeah, it to you. yeah. So there's um, that. And then, um, have you ever used the milk on canvas? I have not. That's a good. That's a good idea. I'll try it on canvas next. Yeah, I, I will try it too. And we'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> I love to experiment, if, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> uh, the color shape, uh, where do you get your color? Uh, yeah, the color, shape. this is the Royal Sovereign Color Shaper. I've gotten it uh, from everywhere from Blick to Jerry's Artorama to. Um, yeah, and it comes in different Amazon. sizes, you guys, so you can get a two yeah. inch or four inch or whatever. I so, like the three inch, yes. firm and flat, firm yes. and flat. Yes. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Val Sparse is from Lowe's or Home Depot. It's archival. You can work on it. You can add things. We have one and a half minute remaining before we get cut off. So I want to uh -oh. make sure that um, please tell us, Nancy, where can we find you? Okay. I've got a new website now. You can find me at artistsjourney.com or you can go to nancyhillis.com and it will take you there. Yes. So that's where I am. I'm, I'm on Facebook. I'm Nancy Hillis Studio. On Instagram, I'm Nancy Hillis Studio. Okay. And yeah. um, are you teaching right now? I am. You, okay. I teach online. Yeah, I'm continually. So all of that online. information will be on live and yeah. I mean on your website. And I will make sure that everything is is shown and uploaded. It's going to be on my Instagram account. It's going to be on my YouTube channel, Sandra Feli Art. It will be on Facebook, Sandra Feli Art. And then Nancy will also pull it up in all her social media. So um, thank you, Nancy. I can't thank you enough. This was a wonderful, wonderful um, interview. Thank you for letting us in your studio, your, you know, your beautiful space that where you create. And thank you for sharing your spirit with us and all your knowledge. 
Oh, thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you so much to all of you out there for being here and for being artists and believing in yourself. I just say to you, keep going and don't give up. Keep painting, keep creating. That's awesome. Thanks, Nancy. <laughs> thank Take you. Take care. Bye. bye, Sandra. Take care. Take bye, care. bye, guys. Bye.